Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, let's uh, come back to the uh, afternoon session. So uh, let's welcome Professor Tetsuya Hashimoto and uh, from, uh, he's from National Zhongxin University. And he's going to tell us about fast radio bursts, which is one of the very hot research topics in astrophysics in recent years. And uh, so just as, as a reminder, so if you have any question, uh, feel free to type it in the chat window and uh, I will speak out the questions for you. And so Tetsuya, uh, feel free to start. Okay, thank you very much for a nice introduction. So I am Tetsuya Hashimoto from National Joshi University. So today I'm going to talk about fast radio bursts. Uh, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to talk about uh, fast radio bursts in this uh, mini workshop. In some places, uh, I'm going to present our results, uh, which uh, is done uh, in this uh, people. Therefore, let me just show the uh, member team here. Okay, so let me get started. Okay, so this is an outline of my today's talk. So I will start with introduction uh, about the basic information on the FRBs. And then let me focus on the origin of FRBs in this talk today. Uh, I am going to talk about the localizations of the galaxies and the number density of FRBs and FRB classifications. And if time is allowed, uh, let me talk about some uh, exciting uh, science, key sciences uh, to be addressed by future FRBs. This is uh, future applications of FRBs. So I try to control my talk time uh, using this text section. And in the end, uh, let me also talk about the future of FRB science in Taiwan. Actually, as you may know, uh, Taiwan currently has a future FRB telescope plan, which is first. So let me try to introduce uh, this new plan of telescope in the end. Okay. And then uh, please don't hesitate to stop me when uh, you have any questions. Please just stop me. Okay. And then first of all, so, okay. So I prepared this video. So just for our imagination. So this is just, uh, okay, before starting, this is just an optical image of the sky, which uh, we can see with our eyes, of course. But of course, we can switch to the radio frequency using radio telescope. And as you know, if you switch to the radio frequency, the universe looks very different from that in optical, right? So it suddenly change in radio frequency. And I would say the one most different part in radio frequency is that, as you can see, there are so many flashes in radio frequency. So this is actually just for imagination, I made this flashing part. Original video is from this here. So if you go to the very short time scale, in this case, a millisecond time scale. So now many people notice that uh, there are so many new objects that no one noticed before. So this is the uh, frontier of astronomers in the next decade. So this is so-called the fast radio burst. So today I'm going to talk about this uh, radio fireworks in the universe. Okay. So let me go next. So this is an uh, imaginary picture of fast radio burst. So actually fast radio burst, FRB, is an extragalactic burst in radio frequency. So which is coming from XR galaxy. So let's say there is an astrophysical source which is emitting this radio pulse, which is here, located here within XR galaxy. And then we can detect this radio pulse using radio telescope on the Earth. And then one uh, unique point of this FRB is its duration. So this time scale, this part time scale of this pulse is really short. So, which is comparable to the millisecond time scale. However, the brightness of this radio pulse is really bright, which can be uh, up to Jansky level. This Jansky level is really bright in radio astronomy. And then currently, uh, there are many radio telescopes uh, finding new FRBs. So, I just selected uh, major radio telescopes, which are actively finding FRBs now. So, why the fast? This is a single dish, uh, world largest radio telescope in China now. They are detecting so many herbs now. 
Uh, so CHIME is a Canadian radio telescope. This is uh, actually FRB survey telescope. And then ASCAP is a pathfinder of SKA uh, in Australia. And then PAPS is also the radio telescope in Australia. <clears throat> so these telescopes are currently actively finding many FRBs. Uh, therefore, uh, this field is getting more and more popular. So indeed, actually more than 10 nature paper uh, have been published about FRBs since 2019. So, okay. And then, uh, actually this FRB science is really new in astronomy. So I think this figure clearly indicates that uh, the FRBs is uh, investigating, exploring a new parameter space in the astronomy. So this is a uh, luminosity uh, in my axis uh, as a function of duration uh, of, of astrophysical sources. So of course there are many different types of astrophysical sources here, including aging and active galactic nuclei, or gamma ray bursts, supernova, or pulsars, proper stars. So there are many different types of astrophysical sources here. And then compared with them, actually FRBs are located here. So this figure clearly highlights that FRB investigates a new parameter space in astrophysics. So FRB has shows very short time scale, say millisecond time scale, but brightness is really comparable to, can be comparable to that of AGN or uh, supernova or, or gamma ray first. But of course, time scale of FRB is really short. Therefore, in terms of total energy, which is much smaller than these populations, but in terms of brightness, luminosity, it can be uh, as bright as these populations. So that means actually we can detect the FRBs at cosmological distances. So therefore, this is really new in uh, astronomy. <clears throat> uh, by the way, uh, my <laughs> slider structure is like this. And then I always put one sentence summary in the title. Then if you don't understand what I'm saying, then please just read the title. And this title is what I want to say in each slide. So, so if you don't understand what I'm saying, then I hope you guys can understand by reading my slide. So then now game, two game changers uh, have arrived, so which are chime and fast, as I mentioned. So this is a number of detected FRBs per year in my axis as a function of year. So as you can see, actually before 2020, uh, we didn't have many FRBs. Say it was more or less 20 FRBs detections per year. But just after 2021, uh, Chime started to uh, detect uh, more than 500 FRBs per year. And also FAST is actively doing follow-up observations of repeating herbies, and then FAST recently detected more than 1,000 repeating herbies. So this 1,000, uh, number of 1,000 is about two order of magnitude more than before. This is really revolutionary data. So therefore it is uh, really time to do the precise science using FAST radio first. So therefore, now many people started to pay, pay attention to this FRB science. Indeed, uh, if you look at the number of publications related to FRBs, it is uh, keep increasing. So this is number of articles, I think about FRBs as a function of year. And as you can see, so this number of publications is keep increasing rapidly. So therefore many people started to pay attention to this. Uh, new sciences in astronomy. <clears throat> so let me uh, summarize a part of this day. But uh, please keep in mind that uh, I actually focus on the observational result in my talk, and then probably I don't have time to cover all of the things. Uh, please understand that basically my talk is about observational aspects of FRBs. Okay. And then, so let me give some uh, basic information on FRBs. So as you may know, actually observationally, there are two different types of FRBs, which are non-repeating FRBs and repeating FRBs. So this is really easy. So this is a pure observational definition. So 
as I mentioned, so there must be the astrophysical source in extra galaxy, and this is emitting radio signal, and then you detect radio signal from this source. And then, if you detect only one type of radio signal from the same astrophysical source, and then we say it is non-repeating like this, because we detect only one type. There's no repeat, repeat only one type, non-repeating non like this. But uh, if you detect more than one FRB from the same astrophysical source, and then uh, we say it is repeating FRB because the same source emitting multiple radio bursts. So this is a repeating FRB. So anyway, so observationally, we have two different types of FRB. And then uh, if we take the order of observable FRB into account, Actually, more than 1,000 FROPs are happening on the sky every day. So this number is actually a lot. But despite this large number, actually the problem is that uh, their origins are still unknown. So we don't know what FROP is. Uh, this is the one of the biggest uh, problem in astronomy now. So, and then let me show the one clear example of FRB detection here, how we can detect FROBs. So people usually use this diagram to show the FRB detection. Say this is a frequency in y axis, observed frequency as a function of time. And then there's a tilt line here. So this is a detection of FRB. So actually this is our first detection reported by Lorimer in 2007. And then uh, this line is FRB. So as you can see, so this line is tilt. So that means the arrival time of FRB actually depends on frequency. For the different frequency, the arrival time is different. Therefore, you see that this tilt line. So this is a typical detection of FRB. <clears throat> so why we have time lag between different frequencies here? Time lag between uh, time, lag of <laughs> time lag of arrival time between different frequencies. Why we have this time lag? So let me explain this. Uh, because this is a really uh, unique observable of FRBs. And also, I always have question about this one. Therefore, let me uh, try to explain first uh, this uh, basic information about the FRB. So why this happens, time lag happens? So actually, this is kind of uh, similar to the prism effect. So, you know, prism is easy, right? So prism, if you put the prism and the optical light go through the prism, and then point is the speed of light within this material, so within this prism, speed of light change as a function of frequency. Therefore, uh, you see actually this, this uh, refraction happens, and then you see this version here. Actually, similar things in terms of this, in, ter in terms of that, uh, speed of light change within the material. Similar things happen uh, for radio emission or fast radio burst. So let me explain. So in uh, FRB's case, people say this is dispersion measure. So what is dispersion measure? Let me explain in the next slide. So now this is uh, just a picture of galaxies. So this is a picture of universe. So it's okay, right? And then uh, you are standing here. There's a radio telescope. Our Earth, say, let's say our Earth is located here in this galaxy. <clears throat> and then, actually, we know that the universe is actually filled with plasma. Uh, even in intergalactic space, actually, intergalactic space is not complete empty. Actually, there are uh, ionized plasma in intergalactic space. So, therefore, for example, let's say uh, FRB happens in this galaxy, and then this uh, radio emission uh, propagates all the way from this galaxy to our galaxy. Then we can detect this radio emission. And then, as I mentioned before, actually this radio emission propagates within the material in the intergalactic space. Therefore, speed of radio emission uh, changes as a function of frequency. So in this case, actually higher frequency, uh, speed of light is relatively higher, uh, faster. And then for the lower frequency, speed of light is relatively slower. 
Therefore, even though uh, these two frequencies, uh, radio emissions, start at the same time, actually speed of light uh, changes while they are propagating. Therefore, when this radio emission arrives at the Earth, actually we see the slight time lag between different frequencies due to the different speed of light at different frequencies. So this is so-called, uh, this is a time lag. This is the reason why we have time lag between different frequencies. <clears throat> and then, as you can imagine, uh, if if RB happens at distant universe, then you have more amount of plasma in intergalactic space. That means you have longer time lag between different frequencies. On the other hand, if HRV happens in the nearby universe, then you have less amount of plasma in between uh, galaxy HRV and observer. Therefore, uh, actually, this corresponds to the shorter time lag between different frequencies. So this time lag, actually, we say uh, this is a dispersion measure. Actually, as you can see from this diagram, by measuring this time lag, uh, actually, we can, to some extent, we can estimate the distance to the individual HLBs. When we detect the HLB, we can know the distance to HLBs using this uh, dispersion measure. So what will happen in the real observed data? So let me try to explain uh, using this one. So let's say there are two FRBs in this data. Uh, FRB1 is this one, this tilt line. This is FRB1. And then FRB2 is this tilt line here. There's FRB2 here. These two are different FRBs. And then uh, what I mean by time lag is like this. Let's say we compare the same frequency. For example, at this frequency, arrival time corresponds to this time. And at this frequency, uh, arrival time corresponds to this time scale. Therefore, time lag between these two frequencies is actually this uh, timeline, which is about 150 milliseconds in this case, I think. So this time lag is actually longer. So therefore, uh, we know that, uh, this, roughly speaking, so we know that this FRB1 is coming from, or came from distant universe because time lag is long. But uh, for FRB2, so for the same frequency ranges, uh, actually the time lag between these two frequencies is relatively shorter. So that means FRB2 uh, happens at a relatively nearby universe. So this is uh, how dispersion works, this dispersion measure works. So dispersion measure is actually time lag. In other words, uh, this tilt of this line uh, corresponds to the dispersion measure of FRBs. So which will allow us to measure the rough idea of uh, distance to individual FRBs. So this is a basic uh, information of FRBs. So then, uh, let me move on a uh, more research part. Uh, in my talk, uh, main part is about origin of FRBs. So maybe I get that question. How can I see? Uh, yes, uh, I will repeat the question for you. Uh, how to know the time lag is caused by ionized gas in intergalactic space or due to ionized gas in our Milky Way? Mm, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, ionized gas uh, should be also in our Milky Way or and also should be in the galaxy hosting FLBs. So, and then for, yes, actually there is a dispersion from this, com this component too. But uh, actually for our Milky Way component, uh, first of all, we observe all together. The observed dispersion measure includes the component from the Milky Way and also components from intergalactic space, and also components from the host galaxy. So these are all together when we observe it. Then if we want to know the intergalactic component, yes, as you mentioned, so we need to subtract this galactic part, uh, Milky Way part. The Milky Way part, actually, fortunately, uh, from the parser observations, actually we have a measurement of uh, dispersion measure within our Milky Way. Uh, and also, uh, there are some uh, models to predict 
that is military component of this virtual measure. Therefore, so what we do usually is we use a model. So actually, depending on the uh, galactic coordinates, actually the model allow you to calculate the prediction of uh, military component of this virtual measure. And then using that model, we can actually subtract the military component. And then host galaxy part is actually difficult. So usually people assume a typical number uh, for that part. So I hope that answer to your question. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, oh, I understand how it works. Okay, so maybe I have to close this one. Oh, sorry. Sorry, okay. So, and then uh, let me move on the origin part. So origin of FRBs, let me discuss. Actually, there are so many FRB models. So actually there are more than 50 models of FRB progenitor so far. And then the problem is, oh, we don't know which is the case. And then here I selected, I just selected, there are maybe more than this, but I selected the possible candidates of FRB progenitors here. So uh, candidates of progenitors are say, white dwarf or old neutron stars and all those stellar mass black holes and magneta, young pulsars, a supermassive black hole, and supernova remnants. So there are so many different types of possible candidates of progenitors here. There are so many models. And also, this is just for fun, actually there's a one paper that claimed that, that this FRB emission might be uh, due to the extragalactic civilization. But of course, we basically think uh, the origin of HLB is from astrophysical source, but this is uh, maybe maybe interesting. But anyway, so problem is there are so many uh, possible candidates of HLB origins here, uh, but uh, we don't have enough observational evidence uh, to conclude the origin of HLBs. So uh, let me explain. But uh, we want to constrain the origin of HLBs, right? So how we can constrain the origin of HLBs from observation sites. So let me explain one by one. Actually, uh, in my talk, I present three different ways to constrain HLB origins. So let me go one by one. The first one is actually direct identification of HLB progenitor. <laughs> so when I say progenitor, uh, that is uh, HLB origin. So when I say progenitor, that's origin of HLB. So this is astrophysical source which can emit HLBs. So this is a FRB project. So how can we identify this FRB project? So let me show the one example of current observation situation. I use the example of CHIME here. So for example, as I mentioned, CHIME currently actively finding many FRBs uh, because this is a kind of survey telescope to to detect FRBs. But they can detect so many FRBs, but individual positional uncertainty of FRB is kind of huge. Let's say, this is just an example, it's not very accurate, but the situation is like this. The size of positional error is of time detection is something like this on sky. And then, so you want to identify the progenitor here, but as you can see, there's no way to identify uh, progenitor because there are so many uh, possible candidates uh, within this era circle line. Therefore, we cannot really identify the exact progenitor. So we don't know the exact location that FRB comes from. This is uh, actually a fundamental problem of current observations. But of course, uh, we have different radio telescopes, therefore, uh, for example, using, this is just an example, but for example, using interferometric observations uh, in radio, actually you can conduct uh, observations with high uh, positional accuracy. Then if you detect the FRB, actually you can uh, make the circle very small, which is small enough to identify the single uh, progenitor. 
within circle. Uh, if you can do this, this is so-called localization. So you localize the position of the Hellbees at a certain position of sky. If you can do this localization using the telescope, of course, this is really strong and this is most reliable because you can directly identify the Hellbee progenitor in this case. If this is a case, or oh, people say, oh, this, this, this object is an Hellbee progenitor, it is really obvious. So this is a most reliable way to identify the origin of a Harvey. Actually, there is a very good example, successful example uh, regarding this localization. So as some of you may know, actually there were uh, galactic Harvey's detected, uh, I think two years ago. And then because this, this Harvey happens in our Milky Way, actually apparent brightness uh, was really bright. Therefore, any telescope uh, could uh, detect this Hellbees. Actually, in this case, uh, they reported uh, three different radio telescopes detected the same FRB here. So, for example, uh, STAR 2. STAR 2 is uh, also uh, kind of fast radio bus telescope, but they have an extremely large field of view, but sensitivity is kind of small. And also, in terms of localization, uh, at this time, uh, localization capability was not very good. Therefore, uh, STAIR 2 detected HLBs, galactic HLB, but uh, they constrained the location of HLB down to only this uh, blue, blue, blue contour, which is still too large to identify the exact progenitor of sky. And then, uh, CHIME also detected the same parts, and the CHIME localization capability compared to STAIR 2, actually CHIME's capability is kind of better. But this is still uh, kind of large. Uh, we cannot really identify the single object within this circle. And the first, this one also detected the same parts, and the first uh, has better localization capability. Therefore, by combining uh, these observations, actually they achieved eventually uh, very accurate uh, localizations of uh, this galactic Hellbee. And then they know, they found that there is a galactic magnetar. This was already found before, uh, but uh, at this location, they found that there is a galactic magnetar here. So therefore, now this is uh, only one confirmed case that uh, we know the exact progenitor of Hellbee. Tetsuya, there's one question in the chat box. Anson, yes. uh, do you want to speak up for yourself? No? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll repeat the question if I can understand correctly. So, um, uh, someone may think that FRBs may come from known sources such as posars or those give fast gamma ray bursts. But after redshift, the bursts become in the radial band. Uh, do you, how do you think of it? Ah, I see, I see. But if you think redshift ahead, that is actually at the most, say, let's say, factor 10. For example, we can observe the universe up to redshift 10, more or less. That means this redshift effect is at the most, say, factor 10 only. Therefore, uh, actually, radio frequency. Uh, for example, gamma ray frequency uh, cannot come to the radio frequency due to this uh, radio shift effect because the difference between gamma ray and radio is much, much more than factor 10. So basically, uh, radio emission comes to radio emission, basically. But of course, it's, it's bound, it, it is possible that, say, um, um, observed frequency is actually different from the uh, rest frame frequency. So, but it doesn't change that <laughs> from gamma ray to radio, something like that. So, was it the answer? So, maybe if you have more questions, maybe you can keep asking. Yes, so, please go on. Okay, okay. Maybe I can go ahead. Sorry, I think I'm spending too much time. So, and for this FRB source, actually they detected two FRBs 
And also, X-ray telescope also detected the birth in X-ray. And then actually two bars corresponding to bars are appeared here. So this point is, uh, this way is really reliable, but actually we have only one confirmed case so far, and then no more direct confirmation of epileptogenitus. This is because actually this localization of the patients is uh, technically difficult. Therefore, it is really hard to increase the number of sample of this direct confirmation. So this is a problem. Uh, of this localization study. And then, uh, this was about galactic FLBs and how about the external galactic FLBs? Actually, for some FLBs, uh, there are uh, localized external galactic FLBs. So let me show the clear example here. So this is a repeating external galactic uh, repeating FLB source, and then they try to localize the repeating FLB on sky, and then they found that the location of FRB source is uh, here, the host galaxy is here, and then within this square uh, here, and then as you may see, uh, there's a dot here. The location of FRB uh, source is here, which is very close to the star forming region in this galaxy. Therefore, uh, this observation example may indicate that uh, this uh, origin of FLBs might be related to star forming activity. Progenitor may be produced through the star forming activity, maybe. But actually, this is really controversial because uh, there is totally opposite result from different FLBs. So let me show this example. So this is also another uh, external galactic repeating FLB source. And then they localize this position again. And then the position was turned out to be the globular cluster position of M81 galaxy. This is M81, and there's a globular cluster. And then this black, black contour is uh, FRB position. The position is exactly on the, uh, on, the, on the globular cluster, this galaxy. So, you know, the globular cluster is really old system. So there must be old population uh, within this globular cluster. So therefore, this observation indicates the origin of this FRB source uh, may be related to all the system, all the stellar populations. So therefore, these two different observation results clearly highlight that uh, there must be the variety of FRB progenitors. Sorry, it appeared and then Oh, I think so. Yes, 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 yes. So distance is not that uh, uh, distant. So, yes. So, you know, what we can observe is the uh, little show up to little show 10. Therefore, little show effect is uh, not that large. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Oh. So, therefore, actually, this uh, observations uh, highlight the controversial things argument about FRB origins. And how about other FRBs, which were also uh, localized? Actually, currently there are about 20 host galaxies identified so far. And then in this paper, uh, they compare the host galaxy property. Uh, this is the color of host galaxy uh, as a function of absolute magnitude. And then, you know, uh, there are two different types of galaxies in the universe, say, uh, red galaxy or blue galaxies. And then, uh, uh, normal galaxies are shown by this uh, black, black, black colors here. And then, FRB host galaxies are shown by these markers, uh, diamond and circle. And then, as you can see, actually, we don't see very clear trend. Maybe many of them are actually close to this blue uh, galaxy, uh, summoning galaxies, maybe. But actually, some of them are consistent with red old galaxies. So that means uh, FLBs can happen uh, in uh, any type of galaxies. But the problem here is uh, actually the number of sample is still small. 
So therefore, this is uh, again the difficulty uh, to constrain the origin of a is using this host galaxy properties. Therefore, uh, it comes to the, our paper. <laughs> so, so let me advertise our paper. So this is the third method to constrain the FRB origins. So problem is, uh, I would say the previous research trying to localize the FRB positions to constrain FRB origins, but it didn't work very well in terms of number of sample. So it is what they really hard to get a uh, general picture of FRB origins. Therefore, we changed our mind and then we to focus on the history of FRBs using 10 times more samples before. So what does history of FRBs mean? So let me explain. So actually we use a new time FRB data in this study. So this work means a paper from our team. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there are so many different types of uh, progenitors here, but uh, let me propose that actually there are two different types of progenitors in here. So one is all the objects which has say giga year time scale. They can survive for a very long time. And then the number density of all the objects, say white dwarf, all the neutron star, or all the stellar mass black holes, uh, should be proportional to the cosmic stellar mass density evolution because you know, the stellar mass in the universe is dominated by all the objects, right? Therefore, if you have more stellar mass, uh, this kind of progenitor uh, should be more. So this is really a uh, basic idea. And then another category is young object, which has mega year time scale. This is much, much shorter than uh, the giga year time scale, right? And then because these progenitors are basically remnant of star forming activity in galaxy, so therefore the number density of these progenitors uh, should be uh, proportional to the star formation rate uh, density evolution of the universe. So, a, oh, I would say supernova remnant oh, is young object because um say my it depends but uh supernova time scale this is the explosion of massive stars right and then the time scale of supernova sorry, sorry time scale of supernova remnant is say more or less mega year so uh if i categorize into giga year time scale and mega year time scale and then actually supernova remnant i would say it is uh really young compared to giga year time scale. So everything is relative, yes, but uh, this is young. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> so then, so there are two different types. And the point is, actually this cosmic stellar mass density evolutions and star formation rate density evolutions, these two things are already measured from galaxy observations in the past. And then let me show this measured uh, density evolution here. So cosmic star formation rate density evolution is shown by blue line here. Actually, this goes to up until it was around two to three. So sorry, this is the y-axis kind of density uh, as a function of either red shift or look back time. And then cosmic stellar mass density evolution is also measured from galaxy observations, and then which shows uh, decreasing trend toward a higher level shift. And then the point is, so if FRB originates uh, from young objects like this, number density of FRBs should also increase toward a higher level shift uh, in proportion to cosmic star formation density evolution. <clears throat> On the other hand, if FRB originates from old objects, the number density of FRBs should decrease toward higher level shift. So that means by measuring number density of FRBs and rate of evolution, uh, we can strongly constrain the origin of FRBs. So this is uh, our uh, basic idea. Then actually I can show that uh, one clear example from the another astrophysical source, which is long gamma ray burst. So, you know, long gamma ray burst, 
is we know that, which is uh, related to the star formation activity in the universe. So uh, this is a number density of long gamma ray bursts as a function of redshift. And the number density, major number density is shown by uh, black colors here. And then, as you can see, the number density of long gamma ray bursts actually increase towards higher redshift and a slightly decrease. And then the cosmic star formation rate density evolution is shown by red line here, this one. So this also increase and slightly decrease. So therefore, more or less, actually this number density of long gamma ray bursts is really synchronized with cosmic star formation rate density evolution. So this is one of the strongest evidence that long gamma ray burst is associated with the star forming activity of the universe. And then actually we already know that this long gamma ray burst uh, progenitor is the explosion of the massive star. And the explosion of massive star is, yes, you know, it is directly related to star formation activity. So therefore, this observation results and confirms progenitor of long gamma ray burst uh, all makes sense. So we really want to plot the same figure uh, for the FRB version. We want to plot the FRB version of this figure to constrain uh, the origin. <clears throat> so now it becomes possible uh, thanks to the CHIME FRBs. So just last year, uh, CHIME released more than 500 repeating FRBs. Actually, in this study, we selected uh, non-repeating FRBs. Uh, then to see the number density evolution. So let me repeat, uh, whether or not if we increase or decrease, this is the point that we want to understand. <clears throat> and then let me show uh, our result in the next slide. And then uh, number density of non defeating LBs from Chime LB is shown by red stars. And then we found that the number density of time non repeating LBs clearly decreased towards distant universe, towards a higher redshift, which de this de decreasing trend is consistent with the decreasing trend of cosmic stellar mass density evolution uh, within the 1% significance level threshold. And then uh, this decreasing trend is really different from the increasing trend of cosmic star formation rate scenario. Therefore, uh, in this paper, we conclude that this cosmic star formation rate scenario is ruled out with more than 99% confidence level. And then uh, this uh, number density evolution is consistent with cosmic stellar mass density evolution. So this uh, may indicate that origin of non repeating LBs are uh, more likely old objects, for example, say white dwarfs or old neutron star or old black holes. So, this is our conclusion. Actually, this book oh, is a uh, blue cover yellow. So, uh, this is not a theory, this is a measurement from galaxies, measurement, observation. Okay, and then actually our paper is not only the uh, this number density papers. Actually, there are many uh, papers investigated number density evolution of FRBs. But let me just focus on the two recent two papers because in the past uh, they used a very small number of sample. Therefore, probably that is not very reliable. Therefore, let me uh, just focus on the very recent two papers, including myself. One paper is that I listed here important factors in our paper. <clears throat> because in this analysis, we want to know the difference between different redshift. How can we know decreasing or oh, disappear? Sorry. So, how can, how can I see um, again? Sorry. Oh, can you see the okay. question now? Can you say that question? Uh, so uh, the question is, how can we know that the decreasing of number of FRBs is not because of not enough resolution? It's hard to observe objects further away. 
Oh, okay, okay. This is, I think we are talking about the observational limitation. So actually, we can calculate the uh, observational threshold, for example, how, uh, how, how, how much bright object we can detect using the time test. Actually, we know the detection threshold. And also, uh, if you put a different HLBs at, and uh, if you put the same HLBs at different little shift, you already know that how the apparent brightness changes as a function of little shift. Therefore, actually, you can uh, calculate this little shift effect uh, by using uh, actual observation threshold. Therefore, uh, the quick, quick answer is uh, these things is already taken into account in our analysis. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And then the point is, we want to know the difference at the different little shift. So therefore, actually we want, we don't want to have any assumption on this little shift evolution term. So because we use a so-called Vmax method, which allow us to measure the number density as it is. So we don't have any assumption here. So any this little shift evolution uh, we can derive, we can estimate uh, using Vmax method. So this is a good part. And also automatically we can test the old population scenario in our analysis. We use a new time sample, which is homogeneous, and then we conclude all the populations. And actually there is another approach uh, to constraining the HRV origins. This is uh, actually they construct the FRB population model. So they make a model to predict the number of FRBs. And then, because this is a model, and then we, they try to fit model to the observed FRBs. Because this is a model, actually they need to assume certain functional shape of this little shift evolution term. So therefore, uh, this analysis is not free from the, uh, this assumption. <clears throat> but they can still test uh, within this model framework, they can still test different scenarios, assuming cosmic star formation length density or assuming cosmic stellar mass density evolution, something like this. Yes, we can test the auto population scenario by constructing their model. And then they use a chime, and also this is homogeneous. And then actually uh, they get a similar conclusion to our paper. <clears throat> so let me really talk about more about this paper. So this is a population model. So the first they try to construct a model of number density of HLBs. So let's say this is so-called energy function, say number density of HLBs here as a function of uh, energy. And they just assume power law. So this is assumption, but it's okay. And then the remaining part, this is really simple, uh, little shift evolution of this number density. So they can assume different types of little shift evolutions here. So for example, a star formation rate evolution, uh, they can assume say number density increase toward higher rate shift and then decrease again because this is star formation. Or uh, this accumulated model means uh, cosmic stellar mass density evolution. Stellar mass is also all, always accumulated. Therefore, <clears throat> this green line, uh, corresponds to the cosmic stellar mass density evolution scenario. Uh, they can also consider the hybrid times. Hybrid means combination between star formation and all the population. So they included 20 star formation uh, scenario and 80% comes from, uh, say, they say uh, delay model, but this is basically uh, all the population. Uh, let me simplify. This is 80% is from all the population. And then once they construct this model, in their model, they know how many HLBs are there as a function of little shift and also as a function of brightness. Therefore, they can just simply apply the observational detection threshold to predict number of HLBs. And they try to see any difference between model prediction and actual observations here. So this is, uh, upper, upper line corresponds to star formation scenario in their model. Now, actually, this is a histogram of dispersion, observed dispersion measure. Actually, I think Milky Way component is subtracted here. <clears throat> anyway, uh, observed data shows this dashed line, and their model prediction 
is solid line here. And in terms of energy of FRBs, uh, observed data is dashed line. Uh, their prediction is solid line. So anyway, you see that uh, this, this, this shows, this, this is not consistent uh, with model. <clears throat> but if you think stellar mass density scenario in their model, actually a uh, model relatively, I mean, <laughs> this is the, the relative things, but a uh, model actually more or less uh, can reproduce the distribution of data points here. This is much, much better than cosmic star formation scenario. And how about hybrid time? So hybrid type I show here in magenta. Actually, hybrid time is 80% of, in this model, 80% of FRBs comes from all the populations. Therefore, it should be similar to cosmic stellar mass density scenario. Anyway, you see almost the same, right? Uh, according to their paper, well, actually, when they calculate uh, KSS, uh, actually, uh, they say that this hybrid type uh, based of each to the observed uh, data point using their model. Anyway, uh, their conclusion is also all the populations dominate. Uh, so therefore, if you look at our uh, last new S2 papers, including our paper, Actually, uh, the, the origin of non-repeating herbies are likely originate from uh, all the objects in terms of this number density evolution. Therefore, uh, statistically, uh, non-repeating herbies are likely originate from all the objects, for, for example, white dwarfs or all the neutral stars or all the stellar mass black holes. So this is a kind of a kind of conclusion. Uh, from this number density argument. So, and then let me move on the final section of uh, FRB origin here. Uh, please ask any question. So this is a little bit of a defined topic, but still this is uh, about origin of FRBs. So now observationally, so we really want to uh, accurately classify the repeating herbies and the non-repeating herbies because one population is repeating, another population is not repeating. So their progenitors are most likely a different, right? Say if it's repeating, it cannot be kind of catastrophic event, right? Say it cannot be explosion or it cannot be merging to objects, something like that. So therefore, uh, this repeating herbies and non-repeating herbies. So we really want to accurately classify these two populations to correctly understand the origin of herbies. So this is very basic, but still difficult observation. So let me explain. So for example, I show repeating herbies as an example here. So this is brightness as a function of time, and then this is repeating as a function of time. But problem is, so our observational time is limited. So we can observe the FRB uh, within certain limited time. Therefore, it might be possible that uh, actually we detect FRB, but this detection is only tiny part of repeating FRBs. And then within limited observation time, okay, we detect one burst. Therefore, observationally, we classify it as non-repeating herbies, but it may be possible that actually this burst is a part of non-repeating herbies. We cannot rule out this possibility always. So this is a fundamental problem of herbie observations. Therefore, actually it's very hard to tell whether or not the origin of repeating herbies are the same or not, are the same as the origin of non-repeating herbies or not. So this is very basic question, but it's still hard to tell. The problem here is observations. So observation needs a very long time, sorry. In order to do this, uh, we need long monitoring observations with a high sensitivity because we don't want to miss any possible repeating burst, right? So, so, so we need a very long monitoring time. So actually, the problem is we don't know how long we should observe, actually. Anyway, so this is a fundamental problem. It's very difficult. But 
there might be one good way. So actually, there is a excellent student in Chinda uh, who is Oliver. Actually, Oliver tried this machine learning approach to classifying uh, observed echolobies. Actually, he used a chime echolobies. Is this? Is an threshold? Is an threshold for brightness of the bit so that they can classify. Oh, currently, I would say there is no clear threshold. Oh, I think many people try to make that kind of threshold, but there's no clear threshold. Uh, yes. But uh, I know that actually on average, uh, repeating with LB shows a uh, fainter uh, brightness compared to non-repeating LBs. So oh, it might be possible, but for now, there's no clear boundary. Yet. So, and then next question. Why do we need long monotonous since every usually occur? Is, ah, okay, okay. So, this FRB, if FRB happens, it's finished within milliseconds if it happens. The problem is we don't know when it will happen. So, say it may happen, say, 10 o'clock. It happens 10 o'clock and it just lasts continued only one millisecond. And the next time it may happen six o'clock, but we don't know the this time scale. So maybe the brightness is just fluctuating. Ah, it's maybe not not really. Uh, maybe I can show the figure. Uh, uh, for example, this one. <clears throat> sorry, maybe I don't have time, sorry. So actually, this is a result from Sonjin in Jinda again. He actually tried to plot the repeating FLBs and the non-repeating FLBs in this parameter space. And then repeating FLB, ah, sorry, this is a duration in y axis, or the function of intrinsic energy. This is a brightness, how bright it is. And then uh, repeating FLBs is located here. And the other data points are all non-repeating LBs. Therefore, uh, if we look at this figure, uh, there might be boundary uh, between repeating LBs and non-repeating LBs. Might be, because they occupy different places in this, this, this parameter space. But currently, uh, there is no clear boundary proposed. So there might be, yes. But the brightness is not really random. Fluctuating. It's it's a really systematic difference. Systematic difference. I hope I answered the question. So let me get back. Okay, I don't have time. So <clears throat> and then Oliver. So Oliver did the machine learning classification of chime echolobies which includes both non-repeating LBs and repeating LBs. So when we say repeating LBs, okay, we are 100% sure that this is repeating LB because we confirm at least two, two, two parts from this source. Therefore, we are 100% sure this is repeating. Red one is repeating LBs. And then black one, when we say non-repeating LBs, actually we are not 100% sure about this classification because one time past doesn't mean it never happened in the past or it never happened in the future. So therefore, uh, there may be always contamination uh, from, from repeating LB sources to non-repeating LBs. And then point is, uh, he found a defined groups in this parameter space. So this parameter space, this parameter is kind of difficult to explain uh, because he inputs uh, many observed uh, parameters uh, to the machine and the machine can try to classify this uh, data. And then this X, I, Y axis in this diagram is kind of projection of uh, multi-dimensional parameters. So this is a kind of projection such that uh, you can clearly see the difference between different groups. You can see the clustering here, right? Different groups of economies here. And he found that uh, there are nine different groups uh, in chime, chime FRBs. And then uh, for some groups, 
uh, there is no zero repeating ECRPs compound, which is shown by black. They are more like uh, pure non repeating ECRPs, maybe less contaminated, maybe. We don't know. But on the other hand, there are uh, actually some non repeating ECRPs, which is located in the same group as repeating ECRPs. Say, repeating ECRPs are here, right? And the blue one. Blue one is actually uh, in the catalog. It is non-repeating herpes, but it is really closely located to the confirmed repeating herpes. Therefore, uh, Oliver identified uh, that these blue guys are uh, maybe the candidates of repeating herpes, which are currently classified as non-repeating, but it may repeat uh, in the past or in future. So, but uh, if this classification works, actually this method is extremely useful for future because uh, we, you don't need to spend a lot of time for monitoring observations to identify the beating herpes. You just put detected herpes into the machine and the machine can classify into repeating and non-repeating herpes. So only one time detection is okay to classification for classification. So this will reduce a lot of observational time if this is the case. But the important thing is uh, we want to really prove uh, this hypothesis. Therefore, currently we are using this first radio telescope in China uh, to try to follow up do uh, follow up observations or for for the, this uh, repeat uh, repeating ahead candidates. So I hope we get a uh, result soon. And then this was about, sure, sorry, yeah, what's more than the machine time? Oh, uh, he used an unsupervised machine learning. Uh, I remember abbreviation, UMAP. UMAP is uh, the name of model. UMAP. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. And then next. So this is about the different Ehabi sources. But uh, as I mentioned before, actually for the same repeating Ehabi, this first telescope recently detected more than 1,000 Ehabi for each repeating Ehabi sources. And this data is just released. Therefore, uh, again, as soon as data was available, become available, uh, this Oliver and also Jasper uh, in Philippines, uh, in RTU, uh, they immediately try to classify uh, the repeating HLPs uh, from the same HLP source. Then we may be able to see different groups, even though this is HLPs from the same source, but there might be uh, different physical mechanisms to emit a herbis. If it is the case, we may see defined groups. So then uh, this is a really preliminary result. Therefore, this is not yet published, but uh, it seems that they found defined groups from the same herbis sources. This may indicate different physical mechanisms or for each herbis sources. Uh, we don't know, but uh, this will be definitely a new result uh, soon. Okay, so I think I'm spending too much time. So let me summarize uh, this HRB origin part. So I talked about three different ways, and then, but uh, let me emphasize that this localization is really important because this is the most powerful way to directly identify the HRB origin. But just because of observation limitations, uh, this uh, didn't work very much. We have only one confirmed case so far. So it's really hard to increase the number of samples in this way. For now, using current radio test. Future, maybe, yes. And then uh, to overcome this problem, uh, we use a number density of non repeating HLBs to strongly constrain the origin of the HLBs statistically. And then this result indicates that non repeating herbies are likely originate from older populations. And then in the end, so now uh, many HRB data became available. Therefore, it is a really good time 
to do perform the machine learning uh, approach uh, to classifying FRBs. So this is just became feasible uh, thanks to the chime and parts. Okay, this is a summary part, a summary of my FRB origin part. So if you have question, maybe you can ask, but if you know, maybe I can go next. <clears throat> okay, no more question. And then uh, I think uh, I have to touch this because recently there is a really amazing result from the FRBs. So let me explain this. Uh, but probably I have to skip some part of this section. So let me talk about applications of FRBs. So I would say the true reason that we really want to understand the origin of FRB is that actually these FRBs are expected to allow us to address many key sciences in astronomy and astrophysics. So I would say this is a true reason that we really want to understand what is FRB, what FRB is. So here I selected the key sciences uh, which may be uh, addressed by future FRBs. So for example, a uh, missing baryon problem or testing general relativity and dark energy and cosmic reionization and dark matter. So there are so many key sciences that we can do using future FRBs. So this is, I think, the reason why many people started to pay attention to FRBs recently. <clears throat> and then if one of them uh, is resolved uh, from using FRBs, uh, there might be a chance to uh, receive uh, Nobel Prize in Physics in the FRB community. So therefore, uh, I'm just encouraging people <laughs> to uh, join FRB science. <clears throat> and then I think I have to mention this one first because uh, recently uh, there's a big news uh, from the FRB team that may resolve the, this long lasting uh, missing value problem. <clears throat> so I had a little bit simplified slide here. So missing baryon problem. So, you know, this is a long lasting problem in astronomy, right? And then this is a pie chart of baryon here. So what is this problem? So actually from different type of observations. So we can estimate the how much uh, baryons are there in the universe. For example, you can observe uh, how many galaxies or how you can count how many stars in the universe or from galaxy observations, or you can measure uh, how many Riemann for absorption systems from the absorption systems of galaxy observations, something like that. Then you can actually do the different type of observations to try to um, count uh, the amount of variance in the universe. And then uh, you can take them all together. Why can you know, we can unlock some problem about the, oh, between F, D, F, D. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, sorry, I don't have a dedicated slide about this one, but uh, one uh, famous argument is, say, we detect many FRBs in future, and then, which is coming from cosmological distances. Therefore, uh, in between FRB, FRB and observer, uh, there may be gravitational lens source here, gravitational lens source here uh, in the path of radio emission. And then uh, recently uh, people started to pay attention to the prime order black hole as a source of dark matter. So if prime order black hole is uh, part of black hole, so there may be black holes, <laughs> prime order black holes. And then uh, when this radio emission goes through the prime order black hole, uh, it can be gravitationally lensed. I mean, if the emission can be gravitationally lensed. By detecting, so, so far there is no confirmation of gravitationally lensed FRB so far, but people expect in future, when we increase the number of sample, uh, we may be able to detect this gravitationally lensed FRBs, and then which can uh, allow you to estimate 
how many prime order black holes are there in the universe. Then, if this prime order black hole is a uh, 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 main main a main component of dark matter, then you can address the dark matter problem. If it is not sufficient to explain the dark matter, then it cannot answer. Mm. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I have, uh, I don't think this is a good slide, but Simon. <laughs> Here, uh, this is a kind of uh, mm, uh, illustration of gravitational lens system. And then, you know, it is, uh, in this case, uh, this is uh, really galaxy cluster is lending source, but you can imagine that there is a prime order black hole here as a, as a lending source. And the point is, if it's red, actually this light path, uh, you can receive the emissions from different light paths because of the this uh, gravitational lens. And then if light path is slightly different, so that means uh, the distance is slightly different. Therefore, uh, you will see, if it's raised, you will see um, multiple bursts. I mean, multiple, I mean, the same bursts, FRB, repeat uh, multiple times because of, because of this different path. And then, of course, we oh 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 it sounds okay okay. If you see the multiple exact same FRBs, and then it may be the lens FRBs. Okay. Yes. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. And then I have to finish this one. I think this is important. <coughs> and then. Uh, so, uh, what we can observe is actually something like this. And then if you take them all together, and then you can estimate the total amount of volume in the universe, but which is shown in this pie chart, but this is still not sufficient to explain the theoretical prediction from, in this case, predicted from uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis uh, prediction. So in this paper, actually about 30% of volume uh, is still missing. So this is a, a long lasting missing value problem. And then actually, where is this missing part? So people usually expect this is most likely in the, in the intergalactic space uh, in a form of plasma, because plasma is usually difficult to detect. Therefore, uh, if there's a missing part, it will be most likely in the intergalactic space. And then it comes to FRB, <clears throat> because as I mentioned, so FRB happens at the cosmological distance, and then thanks to due, due to that this time lag or dispersion measure, actually you can estimate how much amount of plasma are there uh, between FRB and observer. So this is actually directly measuring the variance existing in between you and FRB. So therefore, uh, by using this dispersion measure, actually you can measure the amount of baryon or amount of plasma in intergalactic space along different line of sight or at a different redshift. And then this allows you actually to uh, test this missing baryon problem. And then this is so-called uh, Macquart relation. Uh, Macquart uh, wrote this paper. This is a great paper. <clears throat> so this y-axis is a dispersion measure uh, contributed from the, this intergalactic part that has a function of redshift. In this case, redshift is measured independently from the host galaxies. So therefore, actually number of sample of FLBs is in this figure limited but this is still enough. So uh, actually from observations, or you measure the dispersion measure, and then you also identify host galaxy, and then you measure redshift. Therefore, one dot corresponds to one uh, FRB with a uh, spectroscopic redshift. <clears throat> and then these dots, I mean square uh, and circle here, 
uh, observation result. And then, uh, say optical prediction uh, is shown by solid line here. This is really theoretical prediction uh, where the most variance actually exist in intergalactic space. <clears throat> this is not fitting to the observed data. And then this gray shaded region uh, is also a theoretical prediction. Actually, I think this is from simulation prediction uh, of line of site fluctuations. So because uh, defined line of sight stress defined density fluctuations, therefore this uh, actually this uh, for the certain same same fixed rate of shape, actually this uh, dispersion measure component in intergalactic space actually can fluctuate within this uh, gray shaded region. <clears throat> and then by comparing this theoretical prediction and observable data, as you can see, actually these two are really consistent. So therefore, now uh, model prediction uh, and observations are really consistent by tracing the ionized materials in intergalactic space using fast burst. Therefore, actually some people may say uh, this missing variant problem, problem uh, was uh, resolved uh, from this result. Of course, you see the data points are small, therefore we can do better when we can increase the number of samples. But basic idea of missing variant problem uh, may be already resolved. Uh, from this FRB observations. <clears throat> and then this paper, uh, they uh, focused on the amount of the variance using FRBs. So this doesn't tell you the spatial distribution of variance. So this paper, they are just checking the total amount is consistent or with theoretical predictions or not. That's the total amount. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, next step uh, would be the spatial distribution of uh, barriers. Then actually in future, uh, FRBs, again, may allow us to address this spatial distribution of uh, barriers in future. <clears throat> so this paper is kind of prediction. This is a daily prediction. This is not observations yet. <clears throat> future prediction. So you can consider uh, two different situations here. So now we don't know Oh, okay, okay. Now we know the total amount of baryon is okay. So now total amount is okay. But we don't know where uh, they are. So actual spatial distribution of uh, baryon content, uh, we don't know. And then we can consider the two different situations here. This is, I think this is really simplified, but I think uh, we can get a point from this figure. Say you can consider one case here, left case, so spatial distribution of baryon is really confined uh, within a smaller region in the galactic halo. <clears throat> and then another case in left panel is you can consider the, a wider distribution of uh, relatively wider distribution of baryon content in the galactic halo. And actually, depending on this uh, spatial distribution of baryon matter, uh, actually prediction is different. So they can simulate uh, many different line of sight, which are shown by different straight line colors here. And then along each lines, uh, they can, because this is a simulation, they can calculate the expected amount of dispersion measure for each line. And then you have many different line of sight here. Therefore, it comes to the distribution, which is shown here. Sorry, it is a small panel here. And then, you do the same thing for this scenario. And then they found that uh, actually the distribution of observed dispersion measure at a certain little shape, uh, this shape uh, can be uh, asymmetric if uh, this baryon distribution is really confined in the smaller region. But if baryon can extend a uh, kind of wider region, and then uh, their prediction is uh, this distribution of dispersion measure is kind of symmetric. It's more like a Gaussian shape. Therefore, uh, in future, if we, may, if we can detect, say, in this case, they say 100 FRBs at a certain little shape, we can plot the histogram of observed dispersion measure to see 
if this revision is like this or like this. And then maybe uh, we may be able to differentiate between these two uh, scenarios using this version measure. <clears throat> so that will be the next step regarding missing variant problem. So I think I have to skip. Uh, in the last 10 minutes, uh, let me talk about our future uh, FRB science in Taiwan. So, uh, actually, when we tried to launch uh, this project in Taiwan, we started with a discussion. So, we tried to identify uh, some bottlenecks that limit the understanding of the origins so far. And the argument was like this. <clears throat> So, so what is the weakness of current radio telescopes? So one most important thing is lack of localization capability. For example, CHIME. As I mentioned, CHIME is really powerful to detect ECRBs, but for now, uh, CHIME doesn't have a uh, localization capability. So if you can localize uh, whatever you want, you can do. So for example, spec -Z, spectroscopic redshift, or host galaxy identification, or direct identification of, of or project uh, something like that. So there are so many important works from localization. So this is really necessary for new radio telescope. And then the current radio telescope has a small field of view. Uh, that means the cadence is really short, as uh, cadence is really low. So for example, China uh, has a um, kind of a wide field of view, but uh, actually, which is still limited. For example, time can time is uh, scanning the sky every day, something like this. It's every day time is scanning the sky. But uh, the exposure time that they can observe for each source is really limited. For example, typically it is five to ten minutes they can observe for certain astrophysical source. So this is available exposure time for each source per day. <clears throat> And this time window is really narrow compared to the, uh, the, 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 the duration of one day. So this is only 1% of available uh, one day duration. So time window is really limited. So that means if HLB happens within this only 1% time window, yes, they can detect. But if HLB happens out of this 1% time window, then they cannot detect the HLB's right. So that means there must be so many uh, missing population of HLBs so far. So in order to compensate this one, uh, it, it is better to have wide, of, wide of field of view of the telescope so that we can uh, continuously uh, observe the same object for a longer time. So this is a really important factor. And then finally, the last factor is uh, mismatched distance, what does it mean? So for example, uh, some FRB models predict the associations between FRBs and, for example, gravitational wave or neutrino or multi-wavelength counterpart, something like that. They are model prediction. But uh, basically, that multi-messenger or multi-wavelength telescopes uh, can reach only nearby universe. And then time, for example, uh, can reach length of shield, say one or two. They are actually too distant to conduct follow up observations using uh, G double detector or neutron detectors. So, actually, there's a mismatch uh, between the multi messenger instruments and kind of a time radio telescope. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, in this sense, actually, we don't really need to go to uh, the very high length of shield uh, universe in terms of follow up observations. Uh, rather than that, it's more important to complete, completely detect the nearby FLBs where we can maximize chance to conduct the follow-up observations using different facilities here. So uh, these are, we think, uh, bottlenecks that is limiting our understanding of FLB origins now. And then Professor Penn in Academia Sinica so he launched this project and then we plan, actually I am also involved in this project. And then we plan to have initially uh, 256 antenna in Taiwan. 
uh, in by combining with outrigger station in Hawaii and also in defined places in Taiwan. And then using this baseline, uh, we can conduct interferometric observations uh, to get accurate localization. So the concept is uh, we want to we aim at the world best uh, telescope to detect nearby echelopes in Taiwan. So that's our plan. And then, oh, let me advertise this. Just advertise it. <laughs> so let me emphasize the good part of this telescope. So now we listed the bottlenecks here, and then this burst. Uh, sorry, name of this project is the burst. Uh, can really resolve these three bottlenecks. So burst actually using outrigger station. Uh, this will achieve uh, sub arc second uh, spatial resolution. This is sufficient to localize. I uh, mean, identify. Uh, FRB progenitors or host galaxies. And the field of view of this telescope uh, could be 25 times better than that of China. So that means uh, we have much, much more chance to detect uh, nearby FRBs. We have much more time window to observe. We don't miss uh, any FRBs from nearby universe. And the mismatch in distance, actually this telescope cannot reach very distant universe. But rather than that, this telescope is dedicated to the uh, nearby universe so that we can maximize the chance to observe simultaneously FRBs uh, and the possible counterparts, say gravitational waves or neutrinos or multiple events are counterparts such. <clears throat> this, uh, I believe, uh, this will uh, bring the breakthrough discovery in the near future. <clears throat> Uh, and then also, this is clearly indicates the parameter space of the burst. Y axis is field of view of uh, radio telescopes as a function of sensitivity. So, field of view larger is better, and the sensitivity is actually uh, smaller is better. And the chime is located here in this parameter space. And then, as you can see, this burst actually, there are two different uh, steps. Uh, of this past project. One is constructing 256 antenna first, and then we later we try to increase the number of antenna up to 2048. Anyway, the point is uh, field of view is much, much larger than that of China, uh, which is located here. And actually there is a similar, uh, there's a radio telescope with similar field of view, which is stair to here. But actually, the sensitivity of STEM2 uh, is uh, much, much worse than BIRST. Therefore, BIRST has a about three order of magnitude beta sensitivity compared with STEM2. So therefore, this figure clearly explains that this BIRST explore the new parameter space in the FRB science. Therefore, I believe that this will uh, bring a breakthrough discovery uh, in FRB science. OK, so in the... And uh, let me just briefly introduce so what we are doing. So T is Desno in Chinda. Uh, because thanks to this first project, uh, we are currently trying to predict number of FRBs to be detected with first telescope. So he assumed that galactic FRB like uh, events, and then he predicts how many FRBs, galactic FRBs, uh, may be detected using this first telescope. So, Please forget about an absolute number here, but relative uh, comparison is more important. Say currently working there too, uh, is here, and he found that uh, you first will detect uh, so many uh, galactic FRBs, galactic FRB-like sources. If we compare the number, uh, burst may detect more than 100 uh, times more uh, galactic FRB like event compared with a uh, stair two <clears throat> in future. And then in the end, uh, Simon is also again student in Chinda. Uh, he is trying to predict number of extra galactic FRBs and also number of gravitationally lensed FRBs. And then according to his prediction, so this is preliminary results, therefore, uh, it should appear in paper and later. So more than 1,000 FRB, extra galactic FRBs uh, will be detected using burst uh, in the final state, actually. And then out of that, uh, some uh, FRBs 
uh, would be gravitationally lens. If dark matter is composed of prime order black hole 100%. So therefore, in other words, uh, we can strongly constrain uh, the fraction of uh, prime order black holes uh, in terms of dark matter composition. <coughs> so that's our future prediction. So, okay, let me finish my talk. So my conclusion is really easy, simple. So FRB science is really exciting. So which allow us to address uh, many key sciences in astronomy and astrophysics. Therefore, uh, please uh, try to jump in with FRB science in Taiwan. So this is currently the most exciting uh, phase uh, of uh, FRB science, I believe. Okay, I stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tetsuya, for this very nice talk about FRBs. So uh, are there more questions uh, from the students? You can either uh, raise your hand, click the raise hand button, or type in the chat box. Uh, Leah? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, something I want to ask about the repeating and non-repeating FRB. Uh, we suppose that the non-repeating is uh, old from the old uh, origin or old, old some the uh, old origin that's because the uh we find the we found the frb it is uh close to the uh the yellow curve oh yes so you are i think we are talking about this figure yeah yeah, yeah. Hmm. so yes uh from this uh, number density argument, uh, the conclusion is um, non-repeating FRB is likely originate from all the objects because it will decrease, which is very similar to cosmic stellar mass density evolution. The stellar mass is dominated by all the populations. So this is the conclusion from number density analysis. But of course, uh, we should do the different approach because this is kind of statistical uh, approach. Uh, also, uh, we have to do the direct localization, for example, of non-repeating LBs to try to find the exact progenitors. So we need to do the different approaches to finalize uh, the answer. So this is, I believe, the one of them. Oh, I see. And what about the repeater and we cannot confirm that the repeater from the uh from the new or or old one ah uh, that's a very good point so actually um sorry i didn't include that slide um my conclusion we actually tested if we can constrain the origin of repeating health resources using our approach i mean number density argument but conclusion is the number of current repeating heavy sources is too small to conclude uh, the answer. So uh, we can plot the number density here, but it's very really difficult to see the red shift uh, evolution here because of the just lack of the sample. We need more observations. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's one question in the chat box uh, from Guangming Su, and uh, this is about uh, the non-repeating FRBs as well. So uh, you mentioned that they are generated by the old population. Does that mean those sources only emit the radio burst once in their lifetime, which sounds quite counterintuitive because they are relatively long-lived and quite stable? Uh, this is, I think, really highly depends on how you model this radio emission part. So actually, this observational constraint is just saying the uh, number of progenitors uh, is proportional to star formation density or stellar mass density evolution or not. So therefore, uh, actually, there is a, I think there must be the out of works to try to model this emitting part, and then there must be uh, many different models uh, to try to explain the FRBs from all the populations. So um, that means uh, there might be 
a certain time window for all the population to emit HLBs, but may not. So that's, to be honest, I believe we, we don't know the exact answer to that. So. Okay, very good question. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Last chance. <laughs> okay, uh, if you have more questions, uh, feel free to contact uh, Tetsuya uh, after, afterwards. So uh, let's thank Tetsuya again for this nice talk. Thank you. Okay, and uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, so uh, let's end our lecture for today here. And so tomorrow we will continue the third day of our workshop uh, starting at 10.30 uh, in the morning. <laughs>